You're listening to Don't Waste Water. Hello, Antoine, and this amazing podcast. Glad to be part of it. Glad you're here, Streamy. Hello, bonjour, and welcome to the Don't Waste Water podcast. We did an investigation with Streamy. It gave all the top polluters and showed some graphs. At the end, I said, okay, Streamy, please prepare a presentation for the next meeting. Streamy said, well, sure, fine. Here's your presentation. The room went wide. Why? Because they are engineers specializing in numbers and understanding complex hydraulic problems and wastewater problems. They hate writing presentations. And they told me, you know, at the end of the day, this small thing is hours and hours of suffering for me. I hate it. I'm your host, Antoine Valter, And in today's episode, I'm delighted to welcome Ori Rechef as my guest. You're talking to a friend and he's very convincing and he's very smart telling you nonsense. And the risk is to follow nonsense. So their major concern, once they said, okay, this is cool, this is working, but is it real? Is it really real? This is what we're doing. We're making sure that every answer is real. Ori is Chief Solutions Officer at CanDo. I think the secret will be to be very tailored to solve a problem for a person in the most complete way, but one, not the entire thing, and B, where they're used to work. Meaning that if I have my phone with me all the time and I'm used to working with my phone, why should I ask you to open a laptop in the field? Kendu is a wastewater intelligence company specializing in leveraging artificial intelligence and data for public health and environmental well being. I don't know if you've ever tried Perplexity, it's a freemium tool to search the web, not yourself directly on Google, but through the lens of your favorite AI model, GPT, Claude or Llama, to name a few. It has a scary side, because since Google took over Yahoo in the late 90s, we've developed Googling as a skill, so it's a new habit to learn. But think of it, searching the web through Google really went downhill with time. Have you ever tried searching for a chocolate cake receipt? All the links on the first page that are not ads will be a long and wordy story of how someone found out that receipt while doing some inspirational trip to some nice place, or a story of their grandmother baking as they were kids and so on. That's touching, sure, but all you want is a frigging receipt, right? So you can use tricks like adding Reddit at the end of your search query, or we could enter a new age where perplexity or someone else takes over and introduces a new user experience of searching the web and then name perplexity because they're the ones live with it, but Microsoft Copilot, Google Gemini or OpenAI's announced search GPT go down that same trend. What's that to do with water tech, you ask? Good question, thanks for asking. Well, two things, one for today and one for tomorrow. Let's start with the former. Today, many tools a water operator will use in his daily life have a computer software interface, sometimes a web platform, sometimes a good old on-premise software. Learning an interface and a software logic can be cumbersome, especially if you have many to juggle with and if the stack keeps evolving. So what if you could use natural language, maybe even spoken language, and let a tool translate that into machine lingo. It sounds to me like that is the definition of a large language model or LLM, right? So with today's tech, we could envision a daily operational life where you just tell your dedicated LLM what information you need and it would browse databases and signal loggers to collect it for you and serve it digested and crunched so you just have to do your human magic and take a decision. If that sounds science fiction to you, wait for Ori to introduce you can do Streamy in just a second. So AI could become the user interface today. But now, if we look into tomorrow, why not go the extra step and enter the world of large action models? This time, it's not only about gathering the data and crunching it, it's also about doing the return route. The human still takes the decision, but instead of going to his compressor and set it to 67%, then opening two valves and closing a third one, then put a filter on backwash and so on, the human would, still in natural language, tell his LAM what he wants to do and the AI would push the buttons and turn the knobs. We're not yet there, but we're not so far either. And this opens a whole new set of avenues in a distributed, remote water world. Can it disrupt SCADAS the same way that perplexity might disrupt Google? I'd say it's equally unlikely, but if I were Siemens, Alan Bradley or Schneider, I'd be actively looking into making this one of my core features in my 
my roadmap. That's the future. Let's go back to the present and let's use Can Do Streamy as a case study for what you could do with AI today. Right after I remind you that if you like what you hear, please leverage your next coffee break to recommend this podcast to a friend, a colleague, your boss or your team. And I'll meet you on the other side. Hi, Ori. Welcome to the show. Hello, Antoine. Thank you very much for having me. Very excited to be here today. Well, I'm super excited as well because we actually changed one letter because last time I had an Ari. Yes, <laughs> that's true. Ari was actually one of my first guests on the podcast. It was season wow. one, roughly mid of season one. We had the conversation about can do's. There's probably a lot we want to update, but at the time I discussed with Ari, the reason for can do to be in business was these elements that whatever is happening in the sewer happens in the sewer and nobody sees it. There's a lack of visibility about wastewater and you can make that smart. Is that still the reason for Kendo to be in business four years later or what would be the number one challenge that you're solving today? That's always our basis. We listen to the city from below. That's one of our special sources. What we see ourselves more and more in, and we will talk about it is ambassadors of quality of wastewater. We see in wastewater a real resource. There are so many countries in the world and cities in the world that are recycling, doing direct potable reuse, indirect potable reuse. This is a resource and the quality of wastewater is in our gut. This is something we think sh that should be everybody's business. Your business, my business, the CEO's business, the industries, the environment, the public. The first part, as Ali said four years ago, this is how we started. First of all, let's know about the quality of wastewater. Let's know about what's going on. And then we evolved into, let's see what the source of the pollution is in an automatic manner. Let's help the source behave differently. Let's see the impact downstream and save the treatment plant from a huge stopping activity because the biological part was that there was no oxygen and that could have been treated or worse, all the watersheds. If we look around the world and see the public concern about the watersheds that we all go and with our families and kayak there and swim and, and everything, this should be guarded with a lot of attention. Uh, so what we see ourselves is helping utilities first to cope with the wastewater quality challenge from one hand, understanding the upstream source and behavior and change it so we can improve the quality of the wastewater and making sure there is low to no impact on the downstream, which is the treatment plan and the environment. So we started off by seeing, analyzing, and then helping our customers to do an action to change the behavior. But isn't it a broad challenge here when you say that you go from the watershed up to the plant, a ton of stuff is happening in between those points. How do you focus? As you said, we are situated in the middle. It's a nice place to be in the sewage uh, network, which is exactly in the middle between the upstream, which is the city, the industry's life that produces the wastewater and the downstream, which is the treatment plant and the watersheds and the environment. So quality, as we see it, is everywhere. Our first focus is to help pre-treatment, find the source and change the behavior of the source so we can reduce the amount of pollution, increase the quality in the sewage system and reduce the impact on the treatment plant. That's the first thing. And what we see is that by doing that, our basic job, which is help understand what is the source of the pollution, change its behavior, alert and make sure that the people downstream and in the in treatment plant are completely aware of what's coming in their way so they can prepare. We understand that we have a lot of treasures that we cannot keep only to ourselves, that we need to talk about inside the utility to the asset management people. For example, if you have breweries uh, in your city and they are producing waste, that is very bad for concrete pipes. You want to know that and change. So asset management, marketing, public relations, everybody is concerned by that. And what we're doing is from our core business, which is improving the wastewater quality by finding the source and reducing the impact downstream, we're going more and more. And we'll talk about it through Gen AI, which helps us build quick solutions, but completely full based on our analytics. Focus and then spread the good news. We'll go to Gen AI because I think that's 
the main topic for today. But before that, I'd like to understand where you're coming from. You were having a good life and a great career up to last year. And I don't get why you wanted to go into the poop side of the story because yeah. you're with SAP until July 2023. And yeah. I'm wondering how much of a jump it is to come out of a company like SAP and to say, oh, all of a sudden, those things that were under our feet, which are just conveying poop, that's going to be my bread and butter. So what's your surprise when you jump ship? All my life, I've been in large enterprises or the startups, but always around data, data analysis, data science, startup I was involved in was bought by another American startup, did a big data indexing. At SAP, I headed the product team for the customer data platform. So it's the unification of data, understanding insights and activation of marketing uh, automations to customers. My first love is data and my second love is nature and the planet. I always wanted to combine these two. I met Ari eight or nine years ago when he started talking. I said, oh my God, this is really interesting. This is data that is so hard to mine and to have and to understand, but it's so rich. I wish I could get my hands on it. I spoke for a couple of years and I was uh, consulting a bit as a friend because I was really excited about the mission and really protecting people and the environment. And at one point I said, I'm old enough to say, I want to do something good, not just for me or the commercial side, but also something that will be of impact, a real impact that I can be proud of and tell my kids, listen, this is what dad is doing there for now, making jokes about the uh, dad uh, working in the poop business, but they do, do appreciate it. And I enjoy every moment of it. So the jump was a very different business. The water utilities from the big uh, retailers or the banks or the insurance companies, uh, et cetera. And you meet different people, but that's the beauty of it. I met amazing people that are purpose driven and are, are there for a real reason. And they have this passion towards what they're doing. You cannot beat that. So I'm very happy with that. Let's get to that Gen AI topic. I needed to have a special excuse to have Ken do back and to investigate your path. And that special excuse came with a product you're launching. I don't know if it's yet launched because I couldn't play around with it. True. It's Streamy. And you know what? Instead of me to explain what Streamy is, I'll let you do the elevator pitch to Streamy and then we can discuss it. Okay, so I'll even do better. We'll have our friend Streamy join our conversation and let her introduce herself. Hey, Streamy, tell me what is it exactly that you do for a pre-treatment manager, please? As a pre-treatment manager, I help you by providing insights on upstream pollution sources and the overall health of your network. This includes one, data monitoring. I ensure the quality of data from sensors in wastewater systems, helping to identify and prioritize pollution sources such as factories or facilities, which can impact treatment efficiency. Two, event alerts. I highlight critical events like chemical spills or blockages that might cause overflows or system inefficiencies. Three, action plans. I recommend targeted actions like increased sampling or infrastructure improvements to mitigate pollution risks. Let me know if you want details on any of these aspects. No, just say hello to Antoine and the amazing podcast we're in. Hello, Antoine, and this amazing podcast. Glad to be part of it. Glad you're here, Streamy. What is it? Is it like, I can speak to ChatGPT. I recall maybe six months ago, what did Kuri did live where he was speaking water with ChatGPT. And you can speak water with ChatGPT to a certain extent. It will simply not be as specific as Streamy just was. So what is Streamy? Oh, so Streamy sits on the shoulders of giants. Let's start with the basic. How do you create open AI application? Well, you have three ways of making the AI do a specific task and be an expert. This is part of the uh, answer to your question. What is streaming? First of all, it's an expert in wastewater and in wastewater quality. It's an expert in can do. And how can you do that? There are three ways. The first way is to train a LLM mod, not in our league. This is something that Microsoft will do, that Google, Tesla, Facebook, etc. all the, the, the huge ones. They will have, it costs tremendous amounts of money. Even in the American presidential campaign now, you hear debates on how much energy in going into nuclear energy to power the training of AI model. So Kanto, we think highly of ourselves, but we're not that big and we cannot train a model. So that's one way and not for a company our size. 
The second one is fine tuning. It's not really building and modern. It's taking a modern and, and training it on, on a certain percentage and making it more adapted to your domain of expertise. Also very expensive. We might get there and we'll see how, how the launch is doing. By the way, Alpha is already launched two weeks ago and we have two customers already working with it. Fine tuning will be the second way. But the third way, which is the quickest way, which I actually recommend to everyone, is what we call RAC, which is basically augmented research generation, which is give context. This is why when you talk to chat GPT normally, it will be okay-ish. It read Wikipedia, it read uh, some articles in uh, Water Online, et cetera, et cetera. But what does it know about the specific city in the U.S. and the industries and the risks and what is the chemical composition and the lab results? It doesn't know anything. So I need to give it context. What we did with our streaming is basically we're working on top of OpenAI. This is the engine we are using. We're using our own APIs. We're using the analytical layer to remind everybody can do has contactless sensors inside the sewage system that transmits in real time the data into an analytical server that has an algorithmic pipeline that goes through and creates basically those uh, quality events, qualifies them, quantifies them, understands them, enriches them, and then arrives into insight. On top of that, all this server has APIs. So we question with OpenAI the can do APIs and server, and we give it real-time context. This is the situation right now. We give it all the legal context of the EPA regulation, the permits, our own knowledge. Kandu has extensive knowledge of subject matter experts with years and years. Ari is one of them, of course, the, our founder and Zoal, our co-founder, are real experts in wastewater. And we have a team of subject matter experts that can help us. And we take their documentation, their knowledge, and put it in instructions inside the system. The end user should only ask a simple question. And the simple question will get all this context and go to OpenAI and grab an answer that is with this context. And then we leverage the two things, what can do is doing, the, all the analytical stuff. And then OpenAI will give us the answer, the formulation, analytics. It's amazing. I'll show you some example. It's mind blowing. I bet you played around quite extensively with these kind of tools, but our customers are now using it and we're very, very, very attentive of data security and everything. So they're discovering new stuff. They're asking questions I didn't think of. We'll go to that because I'm, I'm yeah. interested in the why, but just yes. for me to put a bit of context and to understand beginning of this year, I was creating something which I call the H2 Oracle, which was basically I took hmm. all the transcripts of all the people who went on the podcast. So Ari's insight was inside. And I did a vectorization of that. And mm -hmm. this rag element you mentioned, so used it. But I was also restricting ChatGPT so that ChatGPT could not use its own knowledge. It could only use what was inside my vector. Was pretty cool. Got a lot of traction. Got good success. At some point, I had to unplug it just because it got too much traction. And these APIs cost so much yes. that <laughs> I couldn't afford to have like 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 a freebie with my podcast, which was yes. like five hundred to to one thousand per month in API. So, sure. but what's different in what you're doing is that you have that layer of vectorization of the legal context and the expert insights. But what you're adding to that is that you're connecting to the CanDo API, which means yes. that you have an updating and live interaction with exactly. what's in the real world. So it's not like just my garage project. You went above and beyond because you have that API layer. Yes. Do you still enable ChatGPT to browse the web and to look for its internal knowledge, or do you restrict it to your vectors and your APIs? What are the boundaries? So I don't like boundaries with this kind of tools because we are in an exploratory mode and we don't know what we don't know. We're talking with the open AI guys and we say, hey guys, we're chatting with them because we're developing and we need their support, they're working, not working, this API, etc. And we're asking them, hey guys, can we do this? And they go, maybe, test it. And please tell us when, when you come back because we want to know. The thing is, this monster can do so much. And what we did, we launched it with two of our customers. Now the third one is next week will go live. And what we told them, we told them the following, this is an alpha product and we chose the more advanced customers that we have. Please break it. Please do anything you want. Ask any questions. We added the feature of thumbs up, thumbs down and comments. We record 
everything, every question, every answer, so we can analyze it later on. We have what we call inside the database, which is approachable with APIs, a risk assessment map, right? We know the entire geographical area. We have the coordinates of all the industries with a lot of calculation on risks, etc. And we didn't put it in the spec of streaming and it was not the intention, but one of our sales executives said, let me try something. Can you give me a risk assessment of one, two, three, four, five? And it did, and it was perfectly good. The exciting thing about this is that we don't know where the boundaries are. This is the time where we permit ourselves to go wild and go as, as far and crazy as we can. But as you said, at the end of the day, our answers should be spot on. What you're referring to is the a very amusing sometimes effect of hallucinations of the model because it is trained to give an answer no matter what. You have a timeline, you need to spit out an answer, but this can be completely nonsensical and we're talking about a critical system so we cannot say nonsensical stuff. The short answer now, go as wild as you can. We'll close it down at the end of the pilot period. Our customers are already going crazy about it because it, it, it really shortens the time. But let's go into the why, because there are two possible whys and I hope for you that you're for the second one. The first <laughs> why is, you know, everybody's speaking about ChatGPT and Gemini and whoever else you want in the world, because it's not just OpenAI, but okay, it's super trendy. So we need to do something about it. That would be kind of a lame reason, but why not? And yes. the second reason is that you identify something very clear where you say here, it's going to bring tremendous values to our end users. I hope for you it's the second one, but if it's the second one, <laughs> what is that? specific stuff you wanted to achieve. So it is the second one. <laughs> and there are two problems that we wanted to solve that are interwined. Because we believe quality is the most important thing that everybody should be concerned with. And we sometimes saw that even CEOs and executives are talking, they understand the importance of quality, but they do tell you, no, I have this list of things to do and this list of people that should do it. And everything is prioritized. One of the major concerns of the water industry around the world is workforce. I think the statistics is 30% are going on retirement in the next five years and 8% of youngsters are going in. Because you can imagine that young engineers finishing uh, some kind of uh, engineering school will probably go work for Google or Facebook or Amazon than their water utility. You need to, to have a good reason or a good internal motivation to say, I don't want to make this large amounts of money when I'm young. I want to go directly to what my heart is seeking. And it's a hard domain. It's not always an easy job. I think one of the more interesting jobs in the world, but not very attractive. So we have a workforce issue. That's one problem. It prevents our customers from doing their job. They need still to do their job and the job. Let's not forget it. Water utilities give us clean water and protect us and, and recover the wastewater and protect our health and the environment. Super important mission and they don't have people. They really don't have people. They struggle with it. The second thing is Kandu is an analytical system. At the end of the day, we have a dashboard with graphs, pie charts, and all kinds of insights that a smart person should look, analyze, understand, write an email, write a presentation, call a meeting. And then in the meeting, convince people that this is the right thing to do. This is the data that supports it. And let's have a plan, et cetera, et cetera, until you go to the corrective action. So you have a chain from insight to corrective action that takes a lot of time and resources. We don't have people, we don't have time. And now we're adding to the problem because we are adding more information, more data that is important. So you're frustrated. You need to look at it. You need to analyze it. You need to take an action. You need to call a meeting. People are telling you, you know what? I don't want to see that. I don't want to know. You're bothering me because you're telling me stuff that will only frustrate me and I cannot do it. So we said, okay, with technology, with Gen AI, you can have a little helper who's smart, who knows exactly in real time, what's your status right now and can do all those annoying tasks that take so much time for you. It can do the entire digest and ingest of, of, of the analytics. Tell you what is the bottom line. Tell you what you need to do. Write the email for you. Send the email. Write the presentation. Send the presentation. Follow the project. Write the communication email, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a real need for relief. Relief in terms of people. The people needs a lot of minions all around them. Smart minions 
that will just do the job. It's interesting and it's alarming because I had that conversation with Amanda Sikora from Vapar. She was explaining how some of the utilities would not jump boats because they don't want the information. If they start having the information, they will need to act on it and they can't. They'd rather, you know, what I don't know can't harm me. So <laughs> ignorance is bliss. Let, let's not go into that. That's why it's alarming that there is this tendency that we don't want to look at information just because we don't have the means to act on the information. To that extent, you created the augmented operator or the augmented executive or the augmented uh, PR person or whatever, because you're aiming at solving the problem by saying, we don't have more people, we don't have more resources, so how do we do more with less? Well, we use tools. I'm with you on that. Now, when I started the podcast, one of the big questions I was asking around was, are we aiming towards the automated network, the automated plant, the automated stuff like that. And so my vision at the time was we would not have something to augment us. We would have something to do all the boring stuff we don't want to do. And then the human becomes just the one to check what's happening. You would not be the one acting and, and moving a valve. The system would act and move a valve and then tell you it has done it. It looks like we're taking a different direction, which is to say, we have to make it easier for the operator to take the decision, but still he's in charge of the decision. So does that mean that you're using all the intelligence you're gathering with Kendu to augment the operator, but you will always leave the operator in charge and never act instead of him? There are points where you need human intelligence. I completely adhere to your vision. I think robots can go anywhere and automate the system and open valves and close valves, etc. But there is the human factor that should be in the loop. The human should be augmented. More and more automation should happen to make sure human operators are doing what they do best with the mind-blowing capabilities of GPT and all the LLM models. There are two things we can do. One is being creative and solving problems that are more complex and don't have a textbook solution. And empathy. Understand what the effect of a problem has on other human beings and take decisions according to these parameters. I don't see LLMs going there anywhere soon. Lucky for us, we still have some advantage, but this can take us so far. One person can do so much more and leverage their human capabilities much, much more. One of the examples, when we started to work with one of our customers, we did an investigation with Streamy. It gave all the top polluters and showed some graphs. At the end, I said, okay, Streamy, please prepare a presentation for the next meeting. Streamy said, well, sure, fine. Here's your presentation. The room went wide. Why? Because they are engineers specializing in numbers, and understanding complex hydraulic problems and wastewater problems. They hate writing presentations. And they told me, you know, at the end of the day, this small thing is hours and hours of suffering for me. I hate it. I hate preparing the presentation. I hate presenting it. And I hate writing the email that surrounds this. You solved my problem. I said, oh, this is the important thing. Assembling the data, putting all the charts together, putting the bullets, and we solved the problem. Explain how you roll out. You, you, you said you have two customers using the alpha right now. Some questions on that. Yep. First, do you adapt the context to each customer? Let's say one is in the US, the other is in Israel. And um, on one end, it's the US EPA. On the other one, it's the Israeli national water law. So you would not have the same legal context. I would imagine that it would eventually make sense to have for one, the US and for the other, the Israeli regulation inside and to not cross the two in order to not confuse people. So that's one thing. Second, you mentioned you picked people which are more innovation prone or with an open mind or creative people which might be able to leverage that. What was their reaction when you brought streaming? And then I have more questions, but let, let's start with those two ones. The first one, you're completely right. We have two customers, the three that are doing two launched in the U.S. and one is launching next week in Israel. Context is different. When you look at the U.S. as a target market for a company like ourselves, it is very, very different. Water scarcity is different from one state to another. The water laws are different from the way people look, the consciousness. And so we must have different contexts per client, especially in the U.S. where you have the permits and it's per industry, per watershed capacity, Per the state of mind of the legislator in the specific state or county. So that's an advantage that we can give 
context. And the context is per state and sometimes per county and sometimes per, per region. So the context is specific to, to each one. The API, would it connect only to the data of yep. one customer or would it be like a worldwide anonymized stuff which you can then leverage? No, no, we're very, 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 very careful with that. Data is completely segregated. At this point, we're not even dreaming of doing an aggregated. It's in the vision, but the first thing is data security for our customers. So data is segregated. APIs are completely tokenized and securitized and encrypted. One customer can see only their data in their context, which helps us also to be better, actually. One of the nice things is that when you start the thread, with ChatGPT, it holds the memory of the questions. And the more context it has, the smarter it gets and more surprising insight you'll get. How did they react to Streamy? The reaction was wow, because you can talk to Streamy like your smart friend. And they really started talking. I think the major concern is always the same concern. It's the right concern. This is our largest pattern. And this is something that we should talk about and how, how we deal with that which is data quality. Everything at the end of the day is about how good is your data and how clean it is, how reliable it is, how accessible it is, how it is organized. This is the basic of everything. We can do now magic on top of it, but if your data is garbage, it's garbage in, garbage out. And that was always the concern because it kind of augments the concern because you're talking to a friend and he's very convincing and he's very smart telling you nonsense. And the risk is to follow nonsense. So their major concern, once they said, okay, this is cool, this is working, but is it real? Is it really real? This is what we're doing. We're making sure that every answer is real. We have developers, so we have code writers that are software engineers, and we have a team of researchers divided into experts in wastewater and data scientists. Something that is always on and will always continue to invest resources is the quality of the data that we output and the quality of our analytics. The machine learning models that are producing the events are always on a roadmap. There are always two data scientists that are on that. They don't see anything else. They don't know anything else. They know on how good is our data and make sure it's always better. That's the concerns of our customers also. What's a major perk of Streamy could also have a downside. Because if it's highly customized and really tailored for everyone's use, that means before every deployment, you need to adapt Streamy to make it tailored to something. I was thinking, you know, WordWave is a company who launched a mini product called Twitter Roast. I'm not so much of a Twitter guy, so it doesn't speak to me, but I saw all the Twitter guys starting to say, look, I just plugged that mini product on my Twitter. It looks at all my tweets and then it roasts my Twitter and it's super accurate. And it's a product they don't sell. It's a product that really it's offered for free. And it has this kind of viral capacity because you want to test it because it's cool and you want to share the results. Everybody gets to hear about the WordWave company because there's this mini product. And I was just looking up what are the other companies doing that. And you, you have Copy AI is doing a cold yeah. generator. Mm -hmm. Wix has a QR code generator. Hrefs has an SEO keyword generator. And so far and so on, the one which I'm using is CoSchedule has a headline analyzer. Before I put a title to my podcast, I go to the headline analyzer from CoSchedule. Yeah. I, I wouldn't even know that CoSchedule exists if not for that. And so I was just thinking, you know, is there any chance for you, because one of your hats is that you're also in charge of marketing and product marketing. Would it make sense for you to do a streamy light, which doesn't connect to the API because that's the the kind of analytical layer which you don't want to leak out because of safety concerns, makes a ton of sense, but has all this legal context, expert insights you've collected, and hence is a cool tool that, you know, stupid people like me will like to record themselves chatting with that streamy light for three minutes and then share it around on LinkedIn. And so you create virality and you raise awareness of can-do. Hence, you use it as a Trojan horse. Does that make any sense or it's really not what you've intended it to be? It's a bit scary. It's as if you were here today in my office listening to our talk, because <laughs> this is exactly what we're thinking, 200% agree. And the idea of a uh, product-led growth approach, PLG approach with that is amazing, as you said, 
It's always a tricky part, PLG. When you do it a couple of times, how do you create the connection between the free version and the paid version? But I'm putting that aside, it is viral. What we're looking for is exactly what you said. We're looking to do a kind of autonomous streaming that adds some kind of of value. We have uh, a couple of ideas to embed it. If you're the mayor of a city, you can embed it in your website and people can chat about their risks. And for example, for the entire US, we have a map for... The UK and Ireland, we have a map. Uh, Europe, some of it, we have a map. So this is something that we are thinking of completely in the market side. And I invite everybody to Weftec to see what we'll cook up until then. Hopefully you'll be there and we can chat uh, in our booth over a good coffee or beer. So Weftec is the place where Streamylight comes to life. And then you create variety around it. And that's a clever marketing move. <laughs> Let me be the contrarian now for a second, because yes. all of that is super cool and I'm pumped up. I want to also take the other side, which is I get your explanation as to how you can augment and expand the capabilities of the water professionals, the engineers, the executives and everything. On the other end of that same story, everybody's screaming for their attention. Like now your sewer could talk to you, but also your pump could talk to you, but also your... SCADA could talk to you, but also your GIS could talk to you and so far and so on. Everybody wants to be like your best augmented friend. (laughs) So you're fighting for their attention. You know, I'm trying to connect that to your previous employer. And Hmm. in the ERP world, there's SAP, there's Oracle, and then there are some small people, but it's like everything is under one, one roof. Whereas in the water world, I could just look at the alumni of my podcast and find 20 or 30 different people who want to be kind of the water OS and to be that full thing. Long question, which leads to a very simple one at the end. Do you intend to build like the wastewater slash sewer OS, which covers everything? Or in the long run, will you be a puzzle piece which vertically integrates into whoever becomes that OS you are just a link in the chain. You're right to mention my previous employer. With SAP, I was the OS. SAP is an amazing company. Almost all the Fortune 500 companies in the world use SAP. And you can be the OS of the entire enterprise. There, I learned how difficult and how much responsibility and how big of a company you need to be to be the OS. For us to think about that at this point in our lives is not smart. We need to be best in the world in wastewater quality analysis, finding the source and reducing the impact on on the environment. I think it's closer to a piece in the puzzle that can easily uh, go anywhere you want. I think the secret, and and you're very right, is the explosion of data. When you talk with with water people, they say, not that I don't have, I have too much data. As you said, I don't want to see it anymore. You're telling me too much. And you're kind of painting the image, which is very similar to that. And I think you're right. Everybody will want to talk to you, to have your chat assistant, to have your augmented, whatever. I think the secret will be to be very tailored to solve a problem for a person in the most complete way, but one, not the entire thing, and be where they're used to work. Meaning that if I have my phone with me all the time, and I'm used to working with my phone, why should I ask you to open a laptop in the field? If you're already used to it, this is the part where AI should be seamless and Gen AI should be seamless. I want to see it in my Outlook. I don't want to have another application that is analyzing my emails and writing and suggesting and blah, blah. I want it to, to to be done in Outlook or in WhatsApp. I want to chat bot assistant in WhatsApp, analyzing everything. Tell me, if you want to answer this? Click here. I don't want another app. So someone will come along maybe one day and unify the water world. There are a lot of startups that say we will be the uh, water OS. I was in this small company called SAP to be the OS. Oh my God, you need infrastructure, data infrastructure. You need a lot of resources. It's a huge headache. Just think about your data model. Is it covering everything? You know all your sources. There are so many engineering questions that are so hard. I think it should arrive, but it should be done by the the monsters of, of the market. And they should pick and choose experts in the domain. We want to shine in our domain. We get this question actually quite a lot. 
say, given that you're so data oriented and you know your stuff in data and you have your infrastructure, why can't I pour everything that I have to your analytical server? You do your magic and spit out something. That's a much, much larger company with a lot of more investment and a lot of lead time until you can do something as complex as that. So we'll stay humble and pointed. So in the context of, of a streamy, is streamy meant to be profitable or is it one step in the process and then the overall can-do experience is meant to be profitable? The overall can-do experience is meant to be profitable. Streamy is a part of can-do, doing all the things to make our users' life easier, quicker, and really gain the riches of can-do, but it's the part of what we do. And we clear upstream. We make sure your upstream is, is clear. Now we want to do it in your context and augment our users, but it's the can-do experience. Our vision in terms of generative AI is again to build specialized solutions for specific roles in the utility, learn them, know them very well, learn, understand what they need and give them this solution. And with this, we can augment our user base and the, 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 the number and types of people that are using can do. And then again, going back to our mission, quality is our mission. And since we think quality is the business of everyone, everybody should use their own streaming from their perspective. If the CEO perspective is public trust, if the public does not trust you, you have a problem as a utility, you have a problem as the mayor. But if you have a streamy that is always there saying, oh, look, we improved by two quality points, the wastewater quality, and this is the impact of it. I know it as streaming. There you go. There's your LinkedIn post or Facebook post or your press release. Just click here. If the CEO sees their CSAT score, NPS score goes up, then they said, okay, I have a use for this small gadget that I can do put there. So streamy is your UI? But the breadwinner is clear upstream, which is actively bringing all that data, collecting it, putting it together in, in an API form, and then streamy enables you to tap into the API. It's so important what you just said, because people tend to mix everything up and say LLM is magic. And there is the hard statistical, mathematical work and hard hardware work that needs to be done. And this is why we do not give up. On the contrary, double down on the machine learning model, on the anomaly detection model, on the quality of uh, our hardware, on the accuracy of the hardware. Streamy is an amazing addition. It adds a layer of intelligence and analytics, and you can ask for any graph that you want, which is amazing, but it's a conversational UI. Very smart, but it sits on the shoulders of giant. The giant is what we do, is our core business. And our core business is to know wastewater quality and to improve it. And if you don't have that, then okay, you can go and talk to chat GPT Lambda and ask the question and get the answer. And that would be fun, but it wouldn't get the job done. And you're not a super big company, but you're still orders of magnitude larger than me. So you can support the API cost and it's okay for you to keep <laughs> building it. I get it. <laughs> I admire the, the attempt because it goes up really quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I can talk to you, but <laughs> it was expensive, but yeah. At least I learned something. You mentioned you're in the closing of your financing round. For people listening to us, are you full done and just closing or are you still taking calls? We always like to talk to investors that are really interested in that. We're looking for partners. We're almost done, so not much room left. But if you're interested, contact us. We're always happy to talk. We learn from every interaction, so always happy to talk. And to close that deep dive, do you have a KPI for Streamy to say, by the mid of 2025, you'll have rolled out to 20 customers. What's a realistic target for you? The roadmap, we did it very quickly. And I have to mention the super amazing team. We're a 50 person company. We have super talented and motivated people. We have Nadav Karpenkov, who's our VP R&D, who led this. Ornisar, our VP product, did an amazing job. The entire R&D team, the Claras from the, our head of research, we invest in those talents and they surprised me by the, the speed and quality of work. We were able in a very short time to go on production and now working with the customers. So we became more ambitious and we want streaming to be the way that our customers interact with can do hopefully by January, 2025, it will be, there will, there will always be the, the, the dashboard and you can always fall back to what you know, but that's our aim. Another aim we have is to produce 
two more streamies. One, as we mentioned, the more open streamy, closed environment that everybody can play around with and, and have fun. And getting more and more, we have in our roadmap an operational stream for more operational people that will help you optimize around all the network and, and, and manage it, the PR system. We have lots of dreams and we're executing, so it's fun. So January 2025, you go out of alpha, you go into beta or live? Yes. I didn't hear your targets. How many people? How many customers should have it by the end of 2025? At least 20 customers should have it. At least 20. It's a bit frustrating because I don't want to take you for one more hour, but we have more yes. topics because I'd like to understand at some point on the line, the focus of can do on the people, the focus of can do on the workers, and also the focus of can do on the PR communication side, because mm -hmm. those are two directions which are pretty unexpected from a water company like yours. But that's great because it will build the excitation to be around at WebTech and to have that talk exactly. with the beer and the drink and whatever it is. In the meantime, thanks a lot for having been with me on that deep dive and that LLM route. If that's fine for you, I'd propose to switch to the rapid fire questions. It's time for the rapid fire questions. First question, what is the toughest challenge in your opinion for a water tech startup? The fact that they are not working in front of technology companies, the technology is not the main business of water utilities. And they need to understand, to explain the technology in terms of how does it help me in, in life. And so I urge them to go and understand the problem that they're solving and not fall in love with the technology which we often have. What would be your best single piece of advice for the founders and managers of the about 1,000 early stage water startups? Study the problem, study the market, and make sure that if you're leaning on data, that you have it accessible, and if it's real time, that you have a way of uh, acquiring it. I saw, unfortunately, startups that developed amazing stuff, but the lead time to the data or the status of the data was a barrier. What's the drop of knowledge you wish more investors knew about the water sector? Water should be looked at, and wastewater should be looked at as one of our most important resources. It's like gold and like oil and like gas. You should look at it like that and you should look at it long term and you should also look at climate change and what does it mean to water scarcity and water availability. What was your most unexpected partnership and what did it bring you? In can do in a professional life, I think the most unexpected partnership was between the two uh, poles of product house and customer experts. This partnership, this friendship between the two parts really improved our product understanding and product roadmap in ways I cannot imagine. It's not one against the other. It's really a strong partnership. The product is everybody's, especially those who sit with the customers or partner up with them, talk to them. Profitability or growth? Profitability. What's the next profile you'll hire? Data engineers. And when you hire, are looking for sector experience or startup experience? Sector experience. Opening new markets or doubling down on the current ones? Double down on current ones. What's that tool nobody speaks about, but you couldn't live without? I have two examples. One that everybody's speaking about. I'm addicted to ChatGPT and Gemini. I'm a, I'm both. I'm using both for everything in my life. It is embarrassing to say how many domains are now completely there. I pay both OpenAI and Gemini, so I'm working a lot with them. And the other tool is an electric pump for my motorcycle. That's I cannot live without it. What's the single piece of insight your ideal customer profile needs to hear right now? What is the public trust regarding their work? What are you desperately needing and want to raise an open call for right now? People that want to try out and play around with us. Come to our booth, come to WebTech, check out Streamy, check out what it ignites in you. We're looking for people that have an open mind and a passion to explore. So the way to try out Streamy is to come visit you at WebTech at your booth? Yes. Definitely. And for you especially, you'll get a URL. Once we are building a separate environment that is separate from our customers, you'll be the first one to, to use it. Appreciate it. What can and should I do for you? Play around with Streamy and tell us honestly what you think. That would be the best thing. I'll do that. That's within my reach. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Ori. If people want to connect with you and follow up after that conversation, where shall I redirect them the best? Either LinkedIn, you can find my profile, or ori.reshef at kandu.echo. Email me. I'll be more than happy to answer. As always, the links to your mail and LinkedIn are in the show notes. If you're listening or watching, have a look. 
I think we'll have a good chat in New Orleans. So I'm looking forward to that. Thanks a lot for having been with me and talk to you soon. Thank you again for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Don't Waste Water. This podcast was brought to you by GF Piping Systems. Loved this episode? Head over to Apple Podcasts to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. See you next time.